in order to understand Microsoft Teams application and how it works, we first must understand all the components that Microsoft Teams application relies on. As you will later find out in this tutorial, Microsoft Teams as an application does not exist out there in space by itself. It actually heavily relies on other applications within Microsoft 365 ecosystem. So what I would like to do first is introduce you to a few applications within Microsoft 365 that are tightly integrated with Microsoft Teams. The first such application is SharePoint. What is SharePoint? SharePoint is a Microsoft application. It's been around for more than 20 years now. Uh, we had SharePoint since 2001. And historically, SharePoint has been used by organizations for two major objectives, two major use cases. The first such use case is an internet portal. Uh, similar to what you see right now on the screen, SharePoint uh, allows organizations to build company-wide uh, internet portals, essentially communication hubs, where organizations can share information with their employees. So what you see right now on the screen is an example of a company internet built in SharePoint. And you typically have a main internet site, we call it a home site in SharePoint, uh, that has news announcements, you know, links, all the uh, kind of exciting stuff that employees will access. And then the way SharePoint works, it consists of different sites. SharePoint sites. And typically there is a site for each and every department, uh, business unit, function, project, client, uh, and so on. So for example, if I click on human resources, uh, you will get to see the human resources employee facing site, uh, which is meant of course to share uh, information related to HR with the rest of the employees within the organization. And like I mentioned earlier, you could have a site for each and every department a project client and so on. Uh, you could also have private sites, essentially those private collaboration type of sites that would only be accessible by that specific uh, department or project team. So for example, if on the team sites, I click on HR. If you notice now we are on a totally different site uh, with its own look and feel, security and content. And this site, unlike the previous site I showed you, is only accessible by the HR team by the specific you know, members uh, of that particular department. So once again, the main idea behind SharePoint in this particular use case is an internet portal, a one-stop shop for any information you have within your organization, uh, whether there's uh, announcements, news, links, uh, documents, and so on. Which brings us to the second major use case of SharePoint, and that is document management. So if I navigate to one of my sites, happens to be an HR team site, um, SharePoint has some amazing document management capabilities. First of all, SharePoint allows organizations to store documents, you know, files and folders in the cloud and essentially allows employees to access documents no matter where they are, as long as they have a, a computer and a Wi-Fi connection. But SharePoint also has some amazing document management capabilities from version history to check and checkout to co-authoring. There are lots of document management features that allow organizations to collaborate uh, on their uh, documents in the cloud. So these are essentially the two major use cases of SharePoint. Obviously SharePoint is quite a capable platform and there are other benefits, other features that organizations are using SharePoint for, but the internet portal and the document management component are the two you know, primary features that stand out. Another piece of terminology I would like to introduce you to is something called Microsoft 365. What is Microsoft 365? As I mentioned earlier, we had SharePoint for more than 20 years now. And historically, it's been used by organizations uh, for internet portal and document management, among other things, of course. What happened back in 2011, 2012 uh, was this. Uh, we actually got something called Office 365. So what Microsoft did, they did the following. They said, you know what, we have all those great tools. We have SharePoint for collaboration and uh, internet portal. We have Outlook for email, we have uh, Word, Excel, PowerPoint. Let's take all these wonderful applications together, bundle them up, and let's call this thing 
Office 365. And if you hover over the nine dots in the upper left hand corner, you will actually see all the various components, all the various applications that are part of Office 365. By the way, recently Microsoft went through a bit of rebranding and uh, what we used to call Office 365, we now call Microsoft 365. So when we say Office 365 or Microsoft 365, they really mean the same thing. So if you notice, uh, Microsoft 365 is essentially a suite of applications SharePoint included. So SharePoint is still your internet slash document management collaboration platform, but now it's just a small piece of a puzzle. Now it's bundled with all of these other applications that are part of Microsoft 365 ecosystem. Just like SharePoint, all of these applications are based in the cloud. So what that means is that you don't need to install anything or download anything to your computer. You can just literally uh, navigate to a certain URL uh, and access all of these wonderful applications from the convenience of your computer without downloading any additional software on your computers. Another piece of terminology I want to introduce you to is something called OneDrive. What is OneDrive? Look, SharePoint is a team collaboration platform. Any given SharePoint site, so let me pick this HR team site, for example, any given SharePoint site you know, typically has multiple team members and is accessible by more than one individual. This could be the members of the project site, client site, department site, and so on. But here is a use case. What if I want to store some documents privately? I don't want to share uh, those documents with anyone just yet. I do not want anyone to access those documents just yet. I'm not ready to collaborate on those documents with anyone. Obviously, I cannot put them on any SharePoint site uh, because the chances are that other, you know, my colleagues, other members of the team will discover them. So SharePoint uh, is definitely not an application where you can store your documents privately. So in this case, we actually have something called OneDrive. If you click on the app launcher in the upper left hand corner, you will of course see all the applications that are part of our Microsoft 365 ecosystem, SharePoint included. And we also have something called OneDrive. OneDrive is yet another application that's part of Microsoft 365 ecosystem. Let me click on my OneDrive and you're going to see something similar to what you see on the screen right now. So what is OneDrive? OneDrive is essentially your private repository in the cloud. Unlike SharePoint, the only things you can store here in OneDrive are just files and folders. If you recall in SharePoint, we could store uh, news and announcements, uh, events, uh, links, you know, documents and other pieces of content. OneDrive is just about files and folders. That's all you can store here. And OneDrive, is essentially your private repository in the cloud. It is tied to your user ID. So each one of you will have your own OneDrive within your organization. And everything you upload to OneDrive is private to you. If you notice, um, you know, for most of these folders, it says private. Now, uh, you can obviously share certain, um, you know, files and folders with other employees, maybe uh, your colleagues uh, internally or externally. But unless you share, nobody will see the content in your one. Before we get into Microsoft Teams, there is also another piece of terminology that you must understand, something called Microsoft 365 Group. We had this Microsoft 365 Group concept since 2016 or so. So what is it? A Microsoft 365 group is essentially a security group, a membership group that ties the various applications that are part of Microsoft 365. So if you create, for example, a Microsoft 365 group, you will end up with all the elements that you see on the slide. You will get a SharePoint team site. You will get an, a group calendar in Outlook. You will get a distribution list in Outlook. You will get Planner, which is a task management tool that's part of Microsoft 365. And of course, you will also get a Microsoft team attached to it as well. And the idea behind a Microsoft 365 group is that if you're a member of the group, 
you have access to all the elements that are part of the group. So this means that you can collaborate on a SharePoint site and access documents. You can schedule events in Outlook, uh, email and receive messages uh, from the distribution list, manage tasks on Planner, and of course, chat and schedule meetings in Microsoft Teams uh, for that particular group. By the way, once again, uh, Microsoft went through a bit of uh, name change and rebranding uh, recently. So uh, if you sometimes hear the term Office 365 Group, it's really the same thing as Microsoft 365 Group. They just really changed the name. Another thing worth mentioning is that uh, there are actually a few other applications uh, that are part of Microsoft 365 Group, like uh, Forms and Power BI. However, the ones that are listed on the slide are kind of the main, most frequently used applications. Now that I explained to you the concept of a Microsoft 365 group, I would like to show it to you in action. So here is a team site, an HR team site. Uh, and if you notice in the operating corner, it says it's a group. So what that means is that the site is not just a regular SharePoint site. It's actually part of Microsoft 365 group. And as a result, it's tied to all the other components that are part of Microsoft 365 group, like Teams, Planner, Calendar, and so on. If you notice, this team site at the moment has three members, three members that are part of this group. So what that means is that these members have equal access to all the other assets that are part of a Microsoft 365 group. Let me show you all the other assets that were created as part of Microsoft 365 group. So obviously we have a SharePoint team site. That is what you see right now on the screen. We also got a distribution list in Outlook. If you notice, uh, here is the distribution list, a group that was created in Outlook that contains the same uh, three members. And as a result, we also got a distribution list as well for that particular group. We also got a group calendar in Outlook. So if you notice, here is my personal calendar. Here is my group calendar. It actually shows all the other groups I'm part of. But if you notice, I can uh, display, you know, turn on and turn off uh, my group calendar and all the events that are part of that particular group. We also got Planner, which is a task management tool that allows uh, the group members to manage the tasks. And once again, if you notice the same three people that are part of Microsoft 365 group, they have access to this uh, Planner application uh, for that group. And finally, we also have Microsoft Teams, uh, which of course is the topic uh, of this tutorial. Uh, once again, we got a team attached to this particular Microsoft 365 group as well with the same membership. So how do we create this Microsoft 365 group? You can actually create it from any of these locations that you see on the slide. We could create a group from SharePoint and we would essentially get uh, all the other applications as well. We could create a group from Outlook. And once again, we would get, uh, for example, a calendar in Outlook, uh, a group, as well as all the other components. We could go to Planner, create a new plan and, uh, Planner uh, to manage tasks, and we would get a group plus all the other components. And finally, we could go to Microsoft Teams, create a new team from there, uh, which we will do later in this tutorial. And we will get a Microsoft 365 group plus all the other components. Now, there is actually something really important uh, related to Microsoft Teams and Microsoft 365 groups. If I create a Microsoft 365 group from Microsoft Teams, essentially by creating a new team, we will get a team, a Microsoft 365 group, plus all the other components that you get to see on the slide. However, if we create a group from any other location, let's say SharePoint or Planner or Outlook, we would get a Microsoft 365 group, all the other components. However, we are not going to get a Microsoft team attached. There is a way to attach a Microsoft team later on to the group. But if you create a group from any other location other than Teams, you are not going to uh, have a team created automatically. This is something you will be able to connect and attach later on.
So let me show you a few locations where you can create a Microsoft 365 group from. Uh, the first one is SharePoint. So if I click on SharePoint from Microsoft 365 App Launcher and click that Create a Site button, uh, I will have a few choices. Uh, and one of the choices is a team site. And if I click a team site, you actually can see here, it's not a regular SharePoint team site. It's a site connected to Microsoft 365 Group. So it actually tells us that by creating the site, we are going to get a site, a Microsoft 365 Group, and all the other components that you saw on the slide. Once again, with this option, we are not going to get a team attached. This is something we can do later on. The other location to create a Microsoft 365 Group from is Outlook. So I am in Outlook at the moment. And if I click on the groups, new group, uh, once again, uh, I'm creating a Microsoft 365 group. And um, as a result, I will also get, of course, a SharePoint site and planner and other applications tied to it as well. Uh, the only thing I'm not going to get with this option is a Microsoft team attached to the group. Once again, this is something uh, you can attach later on. Finally, we can also create a Microsoft 365 group from Planner, which is a task management tool. So if I click on new plan uh, and give it a name, uh, it actually behind the scenes create a Microsoft 365 group. Plans cannot exist outside of Microsoft 365 group. They have to be tied in to a particular group or a new group has to be created. And that's essentially what's going to happen if I were to create a new plan in Planner. So to summarize, uh, it doesn't really matter where you start, you are uh, getting a Microsoft 365 group. As a result, you could create a team site in SharePoint and get everything uh, included. Uh, you can uh, create a new plan from Planner and create a Microsoft 365 group as a result. Once again, in those cases, you're not going to get a Microsoft team attached. Uh, the only way for you uh, to create pretty much everything at once would be by going to Microsoft Teams and creating a new team from there. This way you would get a Microsoft 365 group as well as all the other components that you see on the slide. Historically, uh, the primary application uh, for collaboration and communication within the organizations was Outlook. So typically, organizations would use you know, file shares or maybe even SharePoint to organize documents. And then they would use Outlook uh, as the primary communication vehicle, essentially a way to communicate on a project or within the department and so on. However, uh, there are several uh, limitations, several issues with using uh, Outlook uh, as a communication application. The first one is the fact that unfortunately Outlook does not have a good integration with SharePoint. So for example, if you have files stored on a, any given SharePoint site, and you want maybe to send an email, attach a few files, uh, or maybe attach a few links uh, to those files within the Outlook. Unfortunately, uh, there is really no great integration. Unfortunately, it's a really poor user experience. Another limitation of Outlook is the fact that uh, it does not have a, a real-time aspect that we are used to having on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. Of course, those social media tools I just listed uh, allow us to uh, collaborate and communicate uh, with uh, our friends and colleagues in real time. And Outlook just is not meant for that. It doesn't have this real time aspect that we're used to with social media. Finally, another big limitation of Outlook uh, is that uh, all these different um, emails and threads, they're kind of disjointed, they're kind of uh, separate from one another. For example, let's say I'm a project member, but I happen to join the project uh, several months after it started. Uh, there is no single location for me to go and check out uh, all the different you know, decisions and communications that happened uh, prior to me joining the project. There might be a few uh, emails, you know, and email threads here and there, but unfortunately there is no one single location for me where I could check out uh, all the communications, all the meetings, all the decisions that have happened uh, on the project prior to me joining it. And this brings us to Microsoft Teams. Essentially, Microsoft Teams addresses all those limitations that I just mentioned that we have with Outlook. 
first of all, Teams as an application allows us to uh, chat in real time, uh, something that we're used to uh, seeing with uh, all these other social media tools. Teams has amazing integration with uh, files, uh, and uh, you can uh, chat in one place, you can access files and folders all from one location. And finally, Teams stores all conversations in one location. So, for example, if I were to join a team, uh, let's say, uh, several months after the project has started, not a problem at all. I can actually retrace all the decisions, all the meetings, all the conversations that have occurred over the years uh, just by scrolling through uh, and uh, accessing all those conversations because they are stored all in one place uh, within a Microsoft team. The idea behind Microsoft Teams is that it's your primary hub for collaboration. It's a single place where you can access uh, files, where you can chat with your colleagues, uh, where you can schedule meetings from, where you can access all the other applications as well. At a basic level, think of Microsoft Teams as Twitter and Zoom built on top of SharePoint. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. Teams, of course, allows you to uh, hold conversations, real-time conversations with your colleagues, just like we can do so on social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter. At the same time, Microsoft Teams allows you to schedule video conference calls, just like you can do so with Zoom. Finally, if you click on the Files tab, you can access all the files and folders that are stored on a SharePoint site, something I will explain later on in this tutorial. It's worth noting that Teams does not have its own document management repository. When you click on the Files tab, you're actually looking at the files that are stored within SharePoint. Now, of course, there are many other applications you can access through Microsoft Teams interface, uh, Microsoft applications, and other applications. But at a basic level, you have the real-time chat capabilities, you have the video conference capabilities, as well as the ability to access files and folders stored in SharePoint. Before we create a new team, it's worth repeating what will actually happen behind the scenes when we do so. As mentioned earlier, Microsoft Team does not exist out there in space by itself. It's actually tightly integrated to Microsoft 365 Group. So when we create a new team from Teams, we will actually end up with a team itself, as well as a Microsoft 365 group. That's where we will manage our membership, our security. We will end up with a team site. That's where the documents will be stored uh, that are part of the team. We will end up with a calendar, which is essentially a group calendar in Outlook. Uh, that's where our events uh, will be organized, uh, the ones that were scheduled from teams. We will end up with a distribution list in Outlook as well, and we will have an ability to create, you know, a, an associate plan from Planner to this group. Some of the applications you might not necessarily be using, like Planner, but if you do have a need down the road to, say, manage tasks uh, on a project, you will have a chance uh, to create a plan uh, and essentially manage uh, tasks related to that particular group, related to this particular team. When you create a new team in Teams, one of the first questions uh, you must answer uh, is the privacy level of a team. So if I click create a new team, and let's say we create a new team from scratch, there are three different privacy levels that apply. Private, public, and org-wide. What is the difference between the three? When you create a private team, what it means is that as the owner, I have to let you into my team. So for example, let's say I'm the owner of the team and you want to join my team, I must allow you to join it. You cannot just join the team, you cannot access my team or uh, any of the documents or conversations until I allow you to join the team. Public team means that you can join it as you wish. You essentially don't need my permission to join the team. Public, it's almost like there is no security on the team. Essentially, if you see the team, you can just join it yourself. You don't even need to contact me. 
Uh, you can join the team, you can leave the team as you wish. Or why team is kind of a special use case of a public team. Uh, with org wide teams, everyone joins the team automatically. So for example, uh, let's say I create an org wide team and then tomorrow we hire some new employees. They will automatically be part of the org wide team. It's very important to note that while you can create private and public teams, only administrators can create an org wide team. So this is not an option most of you will ever see when you create a new team. This is a kind of a special use case, and this option is only available to administrators. Org wide team is truly a special use case, and there might only be a few or none within your organization. At the moment, an organization can only have a maximum of five org wide teams. In order to create a new team, all you have to do is just click join or create a team from the Microsoft Teams application. Now, I must say this, that sometimes you might not see this option. And the reason for that is because some organizations, especially large organizations, uh, prefer to limit the number of teams and disable for the regular users uh, the ability to create a new team. So in case you do not see this option uh, to create a new team, you will need to contact your IT department uh, so they can create one for you. However, by default, this option is available and essentially allows uh, any regular users to create a new team themselves. So once again, just click join or create a team, create a team. There are actually four different ways to create a team. Uh, for now, we'll create one from scratch. Essentially, we're building a brand new team. As mentioned earlier, you will see uh, the privacy uh, levels that you have to set for your team. You have to choose one. Majority of your teams will probably be private, right? This is where uh, you have to let other members uh, into your team. Uh, there might be a few public ones. Uh, once again, the org-wide is a special use case and only IT administrators can create org-wide Team, so you will not even see this option. For now, I'll choose private and we are going to give our project a name. That's all we have to do here. Click create. And the team has been created. Uh, we can actually add some members here, but we will do so later. For now, we'll skip it. And here we go. Here is a team that we just created appearing on the left-hand side next to the other teams that I'm part of. And it's important to note that we did not just create a team. We created a team, but we also got all these other components as well. We obviously got a Microsoft 365 group. That's where we will manage our membership. We got a SharePoint site. We got a calendar distribution list, and we can also manage tasks in Planner as well. The other option to create a Microsoft team would be by connecting it to an existing Microsoft 365 group. This is for situations when I created the Microsoft 365 group from other locations than Microsoft Teams application. So for example, if I went to SharePoint and created a team site from there, and uh, this of course would get me a Microsoft 365 group and other components, unfortunately it would not get me the team attached. So once again, this is the situations when I go to SharePoint, click create a site, create a team site, it does create a group. However, with this group, it will create a site and all the other components, it's not going to create a team for me. So in case you end up uh, with this situation, and it could be a, a valid use case, let's say you created a team site and you really didn't need a team uh, at that point, you just wanted a place to maybe store some documents, so if you ended up with a SharePoint site and a Microsoft 365 group attached, and then several months down the road, uh, you decided to also uh, connect Microsoft Teams because you now need to have conversations related to, to those documents uh, to that particular team site. Well, now you have the ability to do so. To connect a team to an existing group, all you have to do is just click join or create a team, create a team. We're not creating a new team from scratch anymore because we just need to connect it to an existing group. So we must choose this option from a group or a team. And we are connecting a team to an existing group. So we chose this option over here. And what you will then see on the screen is a list of all the team sites that do not have a team attached. All right, essentially these are all the different 
team sites, uh, Microsoft 365 group that do not have a team attached. And you can pretty much uh, maybe pick, uh, let's say, uh, this particular group, click create. And what's actually happening, it's taking an existing group, an existing team site, and just attaching a Microsoft team to it. So it's not creating a brand new Microsoft 365 group. Uh, we already had one. We are just literally connecting the team, the ability to chat, the ability to um, you know schedule meetings uh, for that particular group uh, to an existing group. The third option to create a team would be by copying an existing team. And this is great if you want to, say, replicate uh, a given uh, project team or a client team, uh, maybe you're happy with the specific channels and applications uh, that you configured for that particular team. So all you have to do for this option is just click join or create a team, create a team, choose from a group or a team option. And in this case, we are choosing this team option over here. So essentially, we're just relying on an existing team. And it shows you the list uh, of teams uh, that you own, or that you're owner of. And let's say I want to copy this HR team over here. And essentially, all you have to do is just, you know, give it a name over here and um, choose the corresponding privacy level, private or public. And then at the bottom, it actually gives you an option of what it is that you want to copy from that original team. Um, by default, it copies all the channels. You can copy, you know, all the tabs. You can even copy the membership. Let's say uh, there are three members on this particular project and you have a new project with the same uh, members. Uh, you can actually copy the membership as well. So what will happen, it will literally be a copy of an existing team with its structure and channels and tabs and applications and even membership. And of course, at the end, all you have to do is just uh, click create a team button and a new team will be created. Uh, but the beauty behind uh, this team is that you don't really need to uh, tweak any other settings or anything else. Uh, you, you pretty much get a carbon copy of the existing team with the channels and tabs and membership as well. The fourth and final way to create a new team would be to create a team from the template. All you have to do is once again, click join or create a team, create a team. And then uh, at the bottom, you will get to see a list of all the various uh, out of the box templates that exist uh, in a Microsoft Teams application. Uh, and they're based on different scenarios. So for example, let's say you want to manage a project. You don't know where to start. There is a template for that. Uh, these templates are based on different use cases. If you, for example, uh, want to uh, manage volunteers or manage quality and safety, for example, for your organization, uh, you can choose all those different specific templates. And when you choose one of those templates, uh, these templates are pretty much uh, teams already configured with certain channels, certain names for the channels, and certain tabs and applications that are added. For example, I chose a project team template and it decided to essentially configure all those different channels uh, for my project team, as well as add all those different applications that might uh, be helpful to me to manage a project. They really just give you kind of a starting point. Uh, and obviously you can add additional channels, uh, add, remove applications as necessary. By default, you're going to see essentially all this Microsoft templates that exist. Uh, however, your IT administrators can actually uh, create company specific templates and have them available in this window as well. So let me uh, choose this manager project template once again. It tells me what's going to be configured, what's going to be installed when I create uh, my project team. Click next. And once again, we have to specify the privacy level. We'll choose private. And of course, we just need to give it a name and click create. 
And what you will notice uh, on the left-hand side now, uh, the project being created, but uh, you are going to notice that it's not just kind of a standard uh, team that's created. Uh, we will actually get all those different channels that you saw, all those different applications and tabs. This process will take a while uh, to complete because obviously behind the scenes, all these channels and applications have been created. And here is an end result. Uh, we got a team that got created from that Microsoft Teams project template, along with the four channels that were part of the template, along with the tabs and applications that were created automatically when we created this team. For example, uh, one of the uh, tabs that got created, one of the applications uh, that was created was uh, a list of issues, an issue tracker that would allow uh, the project team to manage uh, issues on the project. Once again, uh, UIT team actually has control over those uh, project team's templates. So if you have uh, specific configurations uh, that you would like to save as templates and be available uh, to the rest of the organization, for example, there is a way for IT team to configure those templates uh, within the admin center. Microsoft team consists of two main elements, channels and tabs. Channels are just literally a way to separate conversations uh, within a given team. Uh, think of a channel like a thread on a forum uh, where you would have a different uh, threads for different topics. Same idea with channels. It's just literally a way to separate conversations on, say, a project team uh, into specific you know, topics uh, by functions and so on. Tabs, on the other hand, are just bookmarks. Think of tabs as bookmarks uh, that allow you to bookmark certain content or bring in the information into a Microsoft team from, from another resource. It's worth noting that each channel has its own set of tabs. So let's say you configured all those different bookmarks, all those different tabs on the general channel. If you click on another channel, another thread within your team, uh, you have a chance to add uh, its own channel tabs and applications. So each channel has its own tabs. As I just mentioned, a channel on a team is just a way to separate conversations. Now, when you create a brand new team, you always get this general channel. This is the default channel. It cannot be renamed. It cannot be deleted. Uh, it's a channel that each and every team has by default. With that being said, you can actually create additional channels. If you click on three dots next to the team name and click Add a Channel, you can create other channels if you want to separate conversations. Now, one of the most important decisions you have to make when you create a channel, you need to choose the privacy level of a channel. There are three types of channels that exist, standard, private, and shared. What is the difference between those three types of channels? A standard channel is a default channel type. Uh, it's essentially a channel that is accessible by all the team members. So say, for example, I'm part of the team, uh, I'm the owner of the team, and Mary and John are also part of the team. In this case, if I create a standard channel, both Mary and John will have access to that standard channel. Uh, they will be able to chat with me in this channel. They will be able to access files uh, and all the tabs within this channel. Private channel is another type of channel that exists. And it's only accessible by a subset of team members. For example, if I use the previous example again, let's say I'm the owner of the team, Mary and John are also part of the team, but we need to have a private conversation related to the project, but John does not need to uh, see those conversations or access any of those uh, files uh, that are part of that private conversation. In this case, I can create a private channel and it will only be available to Mary and I. So we can create a private channel and only certain subset of team members will have access to it. It's very important to note that when I create a private channel, I can only add people to the channel who are already part of the team. 
So in my case, if I'm the owner and John and Mary are members of my team, I can only choose from Mary and John. Uh, only, you know, they can be part of the private channel. Uh, I cannot invite anyone else uh, who is outside of my team. The third type of channel that exists is the shared channel. And essentially, uh, it's like a private channel, but it allows me to add users who are not part of the team. So for example, uh, let's say we're working on a project and I'm the owner of the team, Mary and John are my team members, uh, but I also need to have a conversation with finance and need to bring in David who works for finance uh, and I want to bring him into the conversations, uh, you know, private conversations that we're going to have regarding finance on the project. In this case, I can create a shared channel and maybe I can invite either Mary or John who are part of my team. But the beauty about the shared channel is that unlike the private channel, I can invite anyone else who is outside of my team. So essentially David, who is not even part of my team, I don't need to make David part of my team. I can invite David to the shared channel and David will only have access to that shared channel and no other channels on my team. As mentioned earlier, you already have general channel, which is a default standard channel you always get as part of any team. However, let's say I want to create uh, another standard channel, maybe on my project, I want to discuss business requirements. So I want to separate those business requirements conversations into a separate channel. All you have to do is just click the three dots next to the team, click add a channel. By default, the standard channel is the default channel. Once again, this is the channel that will be accessed and seen by everyone on my team. So let's leave it alone. And I'm going to give it a name, um, business requirements. And you can provide an optional description, but uh, let's click add. And essentially what will happen behind the scenes, uh, the other channel, the other standard channel, will be created. Once again, this channel will be accessible, uh, obviously, uh, by uh, me, by the owner of the team, as well as all of the team members. Standard channels do not really have any unique security. They pretty much inherit security of the team of the Microsoft 365 group. Before we create a private channel, I want to show you who the current team members are. So if you click on the three dots and click manage team, this is something I will actually be covering a little bit later in this tutorial. At the moment, it shows me as the owner of the team and John and Mary are members of my team. So now if I navigate back to my team and click three dots, add a channel. Uh, and in this case, I want to create a private channel uh, for some of those confidential uh, conversations uh, on the project. Uh, I want to create a management channel and under the privacy level of the channel, I'm going to choose private, click create. And I now have the ability to add other members to my management channel. Remember, I can only add members who are part of my team. So that includes Mary or John. Uh, let's say I want to add David and David uh, is obviously a member uh, of my tenant, but he is not the member uh, of the this particular team. So in this case, if you notice, uh, I'm not able to add David to my team because uh, I can only add users who are already part of the team. Once you specify the names, click add, and uh, obviously this will add Mary as the member of the channel, click done. And what you will notice uh, on the left-hand side, you will see the channel created, the private channel created. And because it's a private channel, it will show the little lock next to it. It's a designation to the users that this is a private channel. Now, very important because I am obviously uh, the member of this channel. I created it. I do see it in the list. However, let's say John logs in to this Microsoft team because I did not add John to this private channel. John will not even see this channel uh, in the list. Essentially, this channel, the private channel, will be invisible to John. He's not going to be able to access any conversations 
of files, he's actually not going to see this channel present in the list of channels within the team. The third type of channel you can create on a team is the shared channel. Unlike a private channel, shared channel allows you to invite anyone you wish. Uh, this could be your team members who are currently part of the team. This could be members outside of the team. To create a shared channel, all you have to do is just click three dots, add a channel, and you specify the name of the channel. For example, I want to discuss something with finance. So I'm going to create finance channel uh, under my team. Under the privacy level, of course, we're going to choose shared. And we're going to click create. Once you click the create button, we now have the ability to add other members to the finance channel. And I can choose from my team members. I can choose from team members who are not part of the team. Remember David? who I could not add to private channel previously. Now I can add David to the shared channel because this type of channel does allow me to do that. You can actually bring in both internal users and external users. So you can bring in users outside of your organization, maybe consultants and contractors and vendors and clients. Uh, in order to add external users to the shared channel, there is a bit of configuration that your IT team needs to perform behind the scenes. Uh, so you will not be able to invite external users uh, by default. Once again, this is something that the UIT team needs to configure first. Once the shared channel is created, you will see it uh, in the list of channels appearing under the team. And the shared channel uh, has its own uh, icon as well. Uh, very important to know, just like with private channels, the shared channel will only be seen by those who are members of that particular channel. One other important thing to note regarding the shared channels, that while standard and private channels can be created by regular team members, shared channels can only be created by team owners. So uh, if you're trying to create a channel, uh, a shared channel, and you're a regular team member, you're not going to see this option. This option to create shared channels is only available to team owners. I already showed you how you can add members to a given uh, channel when we created the channel. However, you can always uh, change the membership of a given channel at any point down the road. To do so, you just click on the three dots next to the private or shared channel. Click Manage Channel, and you will always be able to uh, add, remove you know, members uh, and so on. Uh, very important, you can only manage uh, membership or private uh, as well as shared channels. Standard channels, you cannot manage uh, membership uh, at all because remember, standard channels do not really have any security. They are visible to the whole team. As you collaborate on various you know, teams and projects uh, within Microsoft Teams application, it's not uncommon for you to be uh, the member of many teams. So you could be a member of, let's say, 10, 15 teams, and each and every team has uh, maybe several channels. However, uh, there are only a few channels uh, that are kind of super important that you uh, want to highlight and bookmark in a way. And luckily, there is a way for you to do so. So for example, let's say uh, I work for finance, and I am a member of finance channel on uh, many different teams. What I can do is pin that channel, click three dots next to this channel and choose the pin option. And what will happen, it will actually pin this channel to the top uh, of the screen. So this way, uh, if next time I go to Microsoft Teams and uh, I need to access a given channel, I don't need to search for it. I don't need to expand all my different teams. I can just literally navigate to the top left of the screen and under the pin section, I will see the channel bend to the uh, upper left hand corner. And if I want to change uh, this, if I change my mind, I'm no longer part of this uh, project, for example, uh, or the project has entered, I can just unpin it and the bookmark will be deleted.
we also do have some limits that you should be aware of when it comes to channels. As of recording of this tutorial, you can only create up to 200 standard channels, 30 private channels, as well as 200 shared channels. Those limits do include deleted channels as well. So for example, let's say I create a standard channel and then I decide to delete it. I will have the ability to restore a deleted channel uh, for 30 days. So for those 30 days, that channel will count towards that 200 limit. Each channel within a team has something called tabs. And tabs, think of tabs as just bookmarks uh, to bookmark uh, and bring in certain content into your team. Each and every channel has two tabs, posts and files. And these are the default tabs. Uh, and posts, of course, allow you to chat. This is where you hold conversations with your team members. The files tab allows you to access files uh, within Microsoft Teams uh, application. And these are the default tabs. You, you cannot rename them, you cannot delete them. They're kind of permanent tabs that are present in each and every uh, channel. While you cannot change uh, any of the default tabs, you can bring in information from other sources as additional bookmarks, as additional tabs. All you have to do is just click that plus uh, sign and you can bring in the information that is part of Microsoft 365 or you can bring in the information that is outside of Microsoft 365. Uh, literally, a tab is just, uh, think of it as a bookmark uh, to other content. That's all it is. So for example, uh, in our case, I want to maybe add a website. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm going to add my uh, blog site and I'm going to uh, paste the URL of my blog, click save. And what's going to happen, uh, it actually added uh, this website, my blog in this case, as a tab, as a bookmark within this channel. So uh, this way, uh, we can chat uh, on the team, we can access files, and by clicking on this tab, we can now access uh, that particular website. And you can add other content as well. Uh, it could be, once again, uh, things you know outside or inside of Microsoft 365 platform. For example, uh, let's say I want to add a list application, all right? So maybe I need to manage some lists. Uh, we have the ability to do so. so I can uh, create a new list and maybe connect an existing list of issues or some sort of log to my channel as a tab. If you are using a uh, third party applications, let's say maybe we're using Asana for project management, you can actually bring in the information from third party resources as well. Of course, you will need to log in and authenticate uh, into that particular application. But uh, long story short, you can bring in the information from other resources as well. One of the cool options uh, is the fact that you can add other document libraries as tabs uh, in your Teams channel. So by default, of course, if we click on the Files tab, uh, we're going to see the files that are stored uh, as part of this uh, channel, as part of this team. However, here is a use case. Let's just say I have another library uh, that resides on a completely different you know, SharePoint site and I want to bring this in into my team as a bookmark. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to copy that URL uh, of that library, click the plus sign, and we are going to choose document library. It gives us a list of all these different uh, you know, sites I accessed recently. We have a link already, so I'm going to paste the link of the document library. And essentially, it then will resolve the URL, recognize the fact that this is a library, click next. And uh, on that particular side, I guess I have several document libraries. Uh, this is the one I want. I'm going to click Next. Uh, I can give it a name. Let's just say uh, this is a policies library, which it is. Click Save. And what actually happened as a result, my library got added to my team as a tab. So once again, I have this general channel with posts and files and all these other tabs. And if I click on the policies tab, I now have the ability to access 
uh, all these policy documents uh, right from within my team. I don't need to navigate away from my team to another site. They're all available to me right here from the convenience of this particular uh, team and channel. Another tab, another functionality I wanted to show you is the ability to add plans from Planner to Microsoft Teams as tabs. Uh, if you recall, when we created this team uh, in Microsoft Teams, uh, we got a team plus everything else that you see on the slide, including the Microsoft 365 group. Uh, one of the applications we can uh, also utilize in conjunction with the Microsoft 365 group is the Planner app which is essentially a task management tool. Now you can access Planner application uh, if you click on the uh, Microsoft 365 app launcher and click Planner. Uh, this is where you will access all those different plans uh, that you work on. And you, of course, can create new plans or access uh, existing ones. However, if we work in Teams, I might want to manage my tasks from the convenience of Microsoft Teams. Luckily, there is a way for us to integrate uh, a plan right into Microsoft Teams. To do so, all you need to do is just click the plus tab and the application you want to choose is called Task by Planner. Now, by default, uh, when you create a brand new team, there are actually uh, no plans that exist. Uh, if we had one, we would be able to choose one. So let's go ahead and create a new plan. Uh, you can call it whatever you want. Let's uh, uh, you know, keep this default tasks name and click save. And what actually just happened, uh, we now got a plan created that was created uh, under this Microsoft 365 group under this team. And while I can access this plan in Planner as well, I can also, you know, manage my tasks and, uh, you know, essentially assign tasks and work on tasks uh, for this project, right, from the convenience of Microsoft Teams. As mentioned earlier, all the applications that we're adding to uh, a given channel are only applicable to this channel. So uh, now that I added a few uh, tabs to the general channel, if I now click on business requirements, uh, it's all over again. So uh, the tabs, the bookmarks that you add to one channel, they do not propagate to any of the other channels, uh, but you can add uh, additional apps, additional tabs to other channels as well. Uh, another very important thing to note is that uh, you have literally access to hundreds of applications that exist. Uh, by default, it will show you kind of the uh, most you know frequently used ones, the recent ones uh, that you access. But if you want to see the whole uh, database of applications, just click on more apps. Uh, you will see a list of various applications, most of which are even, you know, kind of third-party applications. Uh, once again, uh, the idea here is to bring in the information from other sources, from other third-party applications, and make Microsoft Teams as pretty much a central hub for collaboration within your organization. Another thing worth noting regarding uh, the tabs and applications is the fact that we have the concept of group applications and we have a concept of personal applications. Let me explain. So everything I showed you so far where we added uh, other applications as tabs, this were the group applications. What that means is that when I added those applications uh, as a tab within a given team, channel, uh, those uh, apps, those tabs were visible to all the group team members. However, there is also a concept of personal applications. If you click on three dots uh, on the left side bar, you can add your personal applications. Unlike the tabs over here, those applications will only be visible by you. So these are the applications, the information that will only be accessible and visible by you. So I'm going to add the same tasks by planner application that we added here uh, as a group app, and I'm going to click add. And essentially what's going to happen, it does behave a little bit differently because this is my personal application. It pretty much aggregates all the tasks from all the different you know, plans uh, in planner, uh, all the different you know, to-do lists that I have 
in one location. So essentially it aggregates everything under my tasks and I have one convenient way to manage tasks from Microsoft Teams. Unlike the group application, which only showed me a particular plan uh, that was of course accessible by all the you know team members uh, and all the members who have access to that particular channel. In this case, uh, my personal application is only accessible by me and it pretty much just aggregates the information from all the resources. And you can do the same with other applications uh, as well. Some of those applications are also available as group applications, but they will behave uh, a bit differently because this is essentially my own personal view uh, of the content, all the information available from those applications. One other thing regarding uh, the applications, you will notice that when you try to add some applications to private and shared channels, some of the applications might not be available. For example, I am in the management private channel right now, and I would like to add a plan so I can manage my tasks. Uh, I don't see it in the list, and when I try to type in a task by planner, it's just not here. The reason for that is uh, because if you recall, the plan is connected to a Microsoft 365 group. So the security of a given plan and planner is managed by the membership of the Microsoft 365 group. And because this is a private channel that only consists of few people who are part of the channel, uh, we cannot add a plan that is accessible by the whole team. Uh, because once again, the channel is only restricted to few members of the team. So in other words, we cannot have a plan that will only be accessed and visible by the subset of users. Uh, because once again, the plan is managed in terms of security by the Microsoft 365 group. So the whole team uh, has access to the plan. And there are a few other applications that will be off limits. Tasks is one of them. Uh, there is a calendar app that you cannot add. There is a forms app that you cannot add. And once again, this is due uh, to the same, you know, reason related to security and how uh, those applications are managed in terms of security by the Microsoft 365 group membership. One of the core features of Teams is the ability to chat in real time. When it comes to chat, there are two ways you can chat with your colleagues. You can chat within a given Microsoft team, within a given channel, or you can hold personal chat outside of the team. So if you click, for example, on a given channel, let's say business requirements channel within this team, and by default, it goes to the post tab, this is where you can chat with your team members. Now, all conversations that are happening in here in this area are pretty much staying within this particular channel, within this particular team. So this way, if you have new team members, they can easily uh, obviously join the team later on and access all those conversations and decisions uh, that happened uh, during the project. And of course, each and every channel has its own post tab. Uh, that's where the conversations are happening for that particular channel, whether it's a standard channel, private channel, or shared channel. You can also hold conversations outside of any of those teams. Say, for example, I need to ask Mary a question, and it's more of a personal question. It has nothing to do with any of the project work, it has nothing to do with any of those teams. So in this case, you want to click on the chat uh, app in the upper left-hand corner, and I'm writing a new uh, message to Mary. And essentially, uh, this is like one-on-one -on -one conversation. Uh, by the way, I can write to one individual. I can actually write to a group of users. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is that all of these conversations, they are happening outside of any of the teams. These are like personal, think of them as almost like personal emails that you would write. They are not associated with any of those teams and as a result are not stored in any of the, uh, you know, channels uh, within those teams. When it comes to chat capabilities, they're pretty much uh, very similar and identical uh, to those that you would 
uh, see on Facebook and Twitter. So for example, I want to start a new conversation. I can type in a message. By default, when you type a message, it appears almost like a text message. However, you do have some formatting options as well. Uh, if you click uh, on this icon uh, just below the message, you have some additional formatting options where you can change the style, the font size, the color uh, of your message. Uh, you can also uh, include smiley faces and uh, stickers. I mean, the functionality is pretty much the same as you would see on uh, Twitter and Facebook. When it comes to channel conversations, it's important to understand the difference between replies and new conversation. So for example, let's say I want to start a new conversation uh, and where should we go for lunch? Uh, that's a question to the team. It's very tempting for you to click the button and uh, probably reply to that message. However, that button will start a brand new conversation that has nothing to do with the previous conversation we just had. So instead, if it's truly a reply uh, to that question, you should click the reply button and you know provide the answer over here. This way, uh, it will be more like a thread with a question and then all the answers appearing underneath. If you want to bring a certain message uh, to the attention of the user and uh, essentially uh, kind of highlight it for them, what you can do is mention their name and it works the same way as it does on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, for example, I'm starting a new conversation here and I want to mention Mary, so I click the add sign and then uh, specify Mary's name and uh, my first message to her. So what will happen in Mary's case now that I mentioned her name I am logged in as Mary here in Microsoft Teams. On the activity tab, it will show her that uh, somebody mentioned her name. So if I click on the activity tab, it actually tells me over here, Gregory mentioned you in this particular you know, channel. And this way, uh, it's a nice way for me to uh, bring this to attention to Mary and, and pretty much highlight this particular message and bring it to Mary's attention. Now, there is also a way to mention several people at once by using the text feature. Now, this option is only available to team owners by default, but team owners can actually delegate uh, this uh, feature, delegate the ability to create tags to team members as well. But since I'm a team owner, let me show you how to do that. So all you need to do is just click the three dots next to the team name and click Manage Tags. I don't have any tags that exist, so I'm going to create a new one. So say, for example, I have uh, 20, 30 people on my team and there are maybe two or three that are part of finance. So I'm going to create a finance tag and I'm going to add a few people. Um, so in other words, when I uh, when I type in that uh, you know tag, uh, it will actually uh, bring it to the attention of those two people at once. So here is a tag that I just created, finance tag, and it contains two members. So let me show you now how this works in action. So we're going to initiate a new conversation from this particular channel, click new conversation, and you use the at sign once again, you can mention people, but I can also mention tags now. And as you can see, I started typing the name of the tag finance, and it actually tells me that both John and Mary will be notified. So in this case, if John and Mary, they log into their respective teams, they are going to see this message highlighted under the activity tab. Just like we can pin channels, we can also pin individual conversations happening inside of a given channel. To do that, uh, pick on the conversation you would like to highlight, you would like to pin, click three dots, and click pin button. When you assign the pin to uh, a given conversation, it will actually be pinned for everyone. It's not your personal uh, pin for that conversation. Uh, this pin will be available for everyone uh, who is part of the team, who is part of the channel. So I'm going to click pin. And what will happen, you will see this icon appearing in the operating corner. 
to access all of those spent conversations, uh, what you need to do, you need to navigate to that uh, channel, click that little eye in a circle, and it will give you some information uh, about uh, the members of the channel and the recent contributions, etc. And on that pinned post, you're going to see all the posts uh, that were bookmarked, uh, that were pinned by you or your team members. I just showed you how to utilize the chat capability within Microsoft Teams. You can chat uh, either in the channel on a given team, or you can have personal or group, you know, one-on-one -on -one type of chat. Now I would like to show you how to utilize the video conference capabilities of Microsoft Teams. Just like with Zoom, you can hold video conference calls with your colleagues, uh, with users inside and outside of your organization. There are a few ways to hold a meeting. Uh, there are a few options available. Uh, so I happen to be now uh, within this team, within uh, one of the channels. And if I hover over in the operating corner over the meet button, there are two choices, meet now and schedule a meeting. Let me first show you how to hold an instant meeting. So let's say I want to hold a meeting this very minute. What you have to do is just click meet now and you can call the meeting whatever you want. By default, it uh, defaults uh, to this name, uh, meeting in the name of the channel. Click join now. And what will happen next, you will have the ability to invite your colleagues. Uh, you can copy the meeting link uh, or you can actually add participants and uh, add the names of the users you would like to invite to this particular meeting so they can get it through Teams invitation and join the meeting instantly. And of course, after the meeting is done, uh, what you can do is end the meeting by clicking this drop down and either leave the meeting, which will leave the other users in the meeting, or end it for everyone, which will end the meeting for everyone. Now, not all of the meetings need to occur within a given team or channel. Uh, maybe you want to have uh, a meeting outside of any team. Or maybe you want to have a call with your manager or something. So in that case, uh, what you need to do is click this calendar button on the left-hand side. And once again, uh, we have this meet now option. You just click meet now, give it a name and start the meeting. And at this point, I, once again, you will be able uh, to join the meeting and invite anyone you wish. In most cases, you probably want to schedule a meeting uh, for some time uh, down the road, sometime in the future. So in this case, you once again have a few options. Uh, you can hold a meeting within a given channel in a team. And if you hover over in the operating corner, instead of meet now, you would choose schedule a meeting. And this works pretty much the same way as you would schedule a meeting uh, in Outlook. Uh, you give it a title. You add your required identities, set the, the date and time, provide the details. Once you send the invitation, uh, the recipients will get your invite. And in addition to all the meeting details, um, the invite will also include the Teams link for the users to click on at the time of the meeting. Once you're set with all the details, you just click send and the meeting invite will be sent to your attendees. Likewise, you can also schedule a meeting uh, that is happening outside of any given team or channel. Once again, you click on the calendar and instead of meet now, you just click this drop down on the new meeting and schedule a meeting. And in this case, the meeting is not happening in any given channel. You can actually add a channel if you wish, but you don't have to. In this case, um, you just once again provide the title, uh, the date, time of the meeting and some additional details and click save. And at this point, uh, it will be just like any other meeting invite you send through Outlook. The reason I showed you two ways to hold a meeting, one inside of a given uh, channel in a team and one outside of a team is due to Teams recording. The way you would access your Teams recording would depend on the way where the meeting was initiated from. So let me first show you how to record and access Teams recording for the meeting that is held inside of a given team and channel. 
So I happen to be in this project team in this general channel. I'm going to meet now. You could also obviously schedule the meeting, but let's meet now. I'm going to join that meeting and I am also going to record it. So let's start the recording. Let's wait a few seconds and I'm going to end the recording now. And I'm also going to end the meeting. You will see that within a channel, uh, it will tell you that the recording has started and stopped. And in a few seconds, you will actually see the recording pop up right here. So in order for you to access this recording, all you have to do is just click on that image, on that video, and you can now view the recording video on your screen. So to summarize, since I scheduled and held this meeting in a given channel within a team, the recording can be accessed from the channel, from the thread in the post tab of that particular channel. Now, let me show you the same recording happening outside of any given team. So I'm going to click on the calendar tab on the left hand side, and I'm also going to click meet now. So I'm going to start the meeting. And once again, we'll join the meeting. And just like I did before, I am going to start the recording and leave it for a few seconds so the recording will proceed. So now I'm done with the meeting. I'm going to stop the recording. I'm going to end the meeting. And let's see what's going to happen in this particular case. Since I did this meeting outside of any given team, I'm not going to find the video in any of the teams in any of the channels. To access the recording of a team's meeting that you held outside of any given team's channel, what you need to do is click on the chat tab in the upper left hand corner and you're going to see a list of all the different meetings, teams meetings that you recently had and you're going to see the recording appear under this meeting. If you click on the video image of the meeting, you're actually going to see the actual recording and this is where you can play the recording or download it if you wish. One other thing you need to be aware about when it comes to Teams recordings is that they're not stored forever within Teams. Uh, they actually have an expiration date. And the reason for that is because the video recordings uh, tend to take a lot of storage, uh, so they are only stored for a certain period of time. With that being said, you can actually extend the expiration date or even remove it if necessary, but by default, all the Teams recordings do have an expiration date. It actually tells you right here, this is a meeting we just held, and it even warns you over here that this recording is set to expire and you can change the expiration date if necessary. So what you need to do is click on that image once again to access the video. And in the lower left-hand corner, it will tell you that the video is set to expire in 60 days. And what will happen at that point, uh, the video will actually be deleted and will go to the recycle bin. Uh, however, if you want to extend or maybe remove an expiration date, you just need to click over here and you can extend it by a certain number of days, select a particular expiration date down the road, or maybe you do want to remove expiration altogether, but you have to do it manually for each and every video. And the same thing applies to any Teams recordings held outside of any Teams. Uh, once again, if uh, you held maybe a personal you know, meeting, with your colleagues. Once again, uh, click on the chat tab. Under the recent drop down, you will see your meeting. And once again, you just click on the video itself and you can either remove the expiration date or extend it by a certain number of dates. But once again, don't forget to do it. Otherwise, your video recording will be deleted in a few months. Earlier in this tutorial, I told you to think of Teams as Twitter and Zoom built on top of SharePoint. So I already showed you the chat capabilities similar to that we have in Twitter. I also demonstrated video conference capabilities similar to those we have in Zoom. So now I would like to show you what I really meant when I said that Teams is really an app that's built on top of SharePoint. As you will find out in future lessons, Teams by itself does not have its own document management capabilities. It actually heavily relies on SharePoint and OneDrive for those. So let's go ahead and upload some documents to Microsoft Teams. 
I'm going to navigate to this business requirements standard channel that I have. There are a couple of ways for you to get documents to Teams. You can click on the Files tab, and we are going to click this Upload button. Uh, you can upload files and even folders with files inside of the folder, but let's uh, upload a few files first. So I'm going to grab a few documents that I have on my computer, and let's wait a few seconds. It will take uh, a few seconds for them to be uploaded to Teams, and here they are appearing in Microsoft Teams. Very important, I uploaded these documents to this particular team, to this particular channel. You can also upload documents to Teams as part of conversation. So let's say I want to start a new thread and I want my team to look at this document. So I'm going to click the attach button over here and you can upload documents from your computer, from OneDrive, you know, other teams and channels. In this case, let's grab once again the file from my computer. And here we go, I'm going to send that message. So everyone uh, can see the message and click on the file and access it. But once again, if I click on the files tab, the file I just uploaded as part of the conversation was actually uploaded under the files tab within this particular channel, within this particular team. Now that we uploaded a few documents to a channel within Teams, let's see where those documents are actually stored. And actually the answer is provided right here in the operating corner. It even tells you that you can open all the files in SharePoint. So let's proceed and click open in SharePoint button. When you click on open with SharePoint button, you will actually see the same files and folders you just uploaded into that particular channel. But let me first explain to you what it is that you see on the screen. If I click on the home button on the left hand side, you're actually going to see a SharePoint site that was created when we created this team. If you recall, when we created this team, we got a Microsoft 365 group and all the other elements as well. And one of those elements was a dedicated SharePoint site. And here is a dedicated SharePoint site that got created with its own URL and it has the same name as the name of the team. In the upper left-hand corner, you can actually see that this SharePoint site is connected to Microsoft Teams. And because you got a dedicated SharePoint site, you can actually customize it. You can add, remove web parts from it. But let's go back to the topic of document management. On the left-hand side, you will see a link, something called documents. What this is, this is actually a document library, a file and cabinet that resides on this SharePoint site. And inside of this file and cabinet, if you notice, you see two folders and you probably recognize the names because these are the names of the folders of the standard channels that we created in Teams. The general channel is actually a default channel that already existed, we did not create it, but the business requirements one was the channel that we created ourselves. And once again, if you click on one of the channel folders, you're going to see the same exact files that we have inside of the channel in Microsoft Teams. So to summarize, any documents that you store in any of the standard channels end up residing in a folder within a document library on the SharePoint site that is created for you when you create a new team in Microsoft Teams. Now, if you go to the root of the document library, you're actually going to see two dropdowns inside library and in channels. And the reason for that is because you could actually create folders that are not necessarily tied to any channels. For example, I'm going to create this test folder and I just want to upload uh, some files to that particular folder on the SharePoint site but this particular folder will not be associated with any of the channels. Essentially, it's just a folder that resides in the same document library in SharePoint as those standard channel folders. Now, I would like to go ahead and repeat the same steps and upload some documents to the private channel within Teams. Just to refresh your memory, a private channel uh, essentially contains a subset of my team members. Uh, so that is essentially a restricted channel that is only seen by certain users, not the whole team. Uh, once again, I'm going to click on the Files tab. 
and I'm going to upload a few files. Let's pretty much repeat uh, the same steps, just uploading a few files into the private management channel. Here they are. Now, if we go back to that SharePoint site that got created when we created this team, we do see the two folders uh, for the two standard channels that we created. However, we don't see the folder for the private channel. Where is it? So to find that out, we're back in Teams now, and I'm inside of my management private channel. I'm going to follow the prompt and open in SharePoint once again. And you will notice now the files appear in, in SharePoint. But let me first explain to you what actually happened behind the scenes. If I click the home button, you will get to see a SharePoint site that looks like this. So what actually happened behind the scenes when we created this private channel in Microsoft Teams, it did not upload the files and folders into the standard channel folders on that default site that got created. Instead, it actually created a whole separate site. And the naming convention that was used to create this site was the name of the project dash the name of the private channel. And the same name goes into the title. And if you notice uh, in the document library right here, or you can click the link on the left hand side, doesn't really matter. We do see the document library that could create it on that particular site. And inside of it, the folder with the name of the private channel as well. If you click on that particular folder, you will eventually see the files that you are uploading in Microsoft Teams to that particular private channel. So very important in this particular case, when you have a private channel behind the scenes, it actually creates a separate SharePoint site just for that private channel. The only purpose for this SharePoint site is to secure uh, those private channel documents uh, in a private fashion. I do not expect you to customize this site or make it pretty. The whole purpose of the site is to store those documents that are stored within the private channel in Microsoft Teams. As a matter of fact, many of the regular functionalities you would expect on a normal SharePoint site are not even available here. For example, I'm trying to manage uh, permissions uh, for this particular site and I actually cannot do it. And the reason for that is because the permissions for this site I actually managed uh, as permissions of that private channel in Microsoft Teams. So the site that is created when you create that team, when you create that Microsoft 365 group, uh, is only for standard channel folders. All the private channel documents uh, will actually reside on a separate SharePoint site that has nothing to do with this default site that is created. The behavior for the shared channel within Microsoft Teams uh, in terms of file management is similar to that of private channels. Uh, just to refresh your memory again, a shared channel contains a subset of users from the team plus any users uh, outside of the team. And I have already uploaded a few files into that shared channel under the Files tab. And once again, let's follow the prompts and open this in SharePoint. And just like with private channels, we got a separate SharePoint site that got created when we created the shared channel. Uh, it utilizes the same naming convention, the name of the project dash the name of the shared channel uh, and same naming convention for the uh, site title as well. And just like with private channels, uh, all the documents reside in the document library that is part of that SharePoint site, that extra SharePoint site that got created. And this is really important to understand because as the owner of the team, you're probably concerned about uh, the location uh, of all the files, of all the documents that you store within a team. So for example, let's say you create a new team. Uh, by default, you're obviously getting a dedicated SharePoint site. But if you then decide to create, let's say, two private channels and then maybe uh, three shared channels, you're actually going to get a total of six SharePoint sites. You're getting one site as a default site. That's where the standard channel folders will reside. And then you're getting one site for each private and one site for each shared channel. And as I mentioned previously, uh, I do not expect you to customize any of those shared or private sites 
the only purpose for those sites was to assure that the content is securely stored and has a dedicated location within SharePoint. So far, I showed you how Microsoft Teams handles files when you upload them uh, inside of uh, Microsoft Teams channels. Uh, we have certain behavior when we upload documents uh, within the standard channels. We have uh, completely different behavior when we upload documents to private and shared channels. However, what if you also upload documents as part of private chat conversations? For example, uh, let me click on the chat tab and I'm having a conversation with Mary and I want her to take a look uh, at this document I'm going to attach. I'm going to once again upload the document from my computer. And I provided Mary some instructions to check out this document and I click the send button. So Mary now received that chat uh, in her Teams and she can click on the document and access it. But where does this document store? Because remember, this is not a chat conversation happening inside of a given team or a given channel. So I'm not going to find this files in any of those channel or SharePoint site folders. In case if you are uploading documents as part of your private chat conversations, essentially the conversations that are happening outside of any given team, the documents end up being stored on users OneDrive. So let me go ahead and access my OneDrive account. And of course, under my OneDrive, I'm going to see a bunch of files and folders that uh, I store in my OneDrive. And one of the folders that is actually automatically created for you is something called the Microsoft Teams chat files. If you click on that folder, you're going to see the files that I have uploaded over the years as part of private chat conversations. And right on top is the document that I just uploaded and shared with Mary. If you recall, OneDrive is your private repository. So by default, all the files and folders have a private designation. However, if you click on that folder, you will notice that the file I just shared has the shared designation. So if I click share, it actually tells me that I have shared this document and provided a link that users, other users can click on and access the document. So what that means is that if I, for whatever reason, I uh, want to stop sharing, I don't want Mary or anyone else to see this document. All I have to do is just click stop sharing. And what will actually happen, the document will still reside in my OneDrive, but the designation of sharing will change to private. So if Mary tries to access this document, click on the link from her teams, she now will not be able to access this document anymore. Now, if Mary decided to share a document with me, essentially it will be stored on her OneDrive. So at the end of the day, the document is always stored on a user's OneDrive who initiated the conversation, who uploaded the document to the chat in the first place. One other thing related to file management is the fact that Teams meetings recordings are actually stored in SharePoint as well. If you recall, a little bit early in the tutorial, we recorded a meeting uh, that I held this particular project in this general uh, standard uh, channel. And of course, you can access the recording and then uh, even change the expiration date by clicking uh, on the image, by clicking on the video from within Teams. But if you also navigate to that SharePoint site, that default SharePoint site that got created when we created this team, and we are going to go inside of the document library, and I'm going to click inside of the general channel, you're going to see the recordings folder. And this is essentially a folder that contains all the recordings that you record in Microsoft Teams for this particular channel. And if you held meetings in any other channel, any other standard channel or private channels, shared channels, uh, each of those channels would get uh, its own uh, folder called recordings, and that's where the recordings would be stored. If you decide to hold meetings outside of any given team channel, the recordings for those meetings will be stored in your OneDrive. So once again, what you see right now on the screen is my personal OneDrive, and this folder called recordings was created for me automatically. And essentially, it stores all the different meetings, all the different recordings that I held 
outside of any given theme channel. One of the cool file management capabilities of Microsoft Teams is the fact that you can actually connect other cloud storage solutions to your Microsoft team. Uh, let me show you how this works. So I happen to be inside of this team, inside of this business requirements standard channel, and you can actually click add cloud storage. And this is where you can choose other sources you would like to connect. You can actually connect other document libraries that are stored inside of SharePoint, or you can even connect third-party cloud storage solutions as well. So for example, if you have some data residing in Dropbox or Google Drive, you can actually connect the sources. Of course, you will need to log in with your credentials to be able to connect those sources. But for now, let me just show you how to connect another library within SharePoint. So I'm going to choose SharePoint as an option, and I'm actually going to connect uh, this particular policies library that I have uh, residing on some other SharePoint site. So I'm going to copy the URL, navigate back to Microsoft Teams, and I'm going to paste that link into the field. It does resolve my uh, site. Uh, click Next. Uh, it will then show me all the different libraries that reside on my site. And I'm going to choose this one. That's where the policies are stored. Click Next and Add Folder. And what you are going to see is actually a link to that document library right from within the channel in a Microsoft team. So essentially, under the Files tab, I now have all my regular files that are stored inside of this channel. And now if I click on this link, I'm actually going to see the other library that is residing on completely separate SharePoint site, completely separate document library. If you recall a little bit early in this tutorial, I actually showed you how you can add a document library as a tab to any given channel, and you can still do that. However, you now have that second option where instead of adding it as a tab, you pretty much just connect another source, connect another cloud storage to an existing file tab. And this way, with this particular option, uh, you actually have everything in one place. You don't have another tab to click on. You have your regular files and folders that are stored within this channel. And then you have all those different links that bring you directly to the other sources as well. Very important to note, uh, and this was true for the tab option, as well as this cloud storage option. When you add another source, let's say another library from SharePoint, you do need to make sure that users, the team members of the team, have access to this library. If they don't, uh, they will not be able to access this link uh, that you added, this bookmark that you added within your file tab. In case if you decide to delete channels, you need to understand the behavior and what's happening behind the scenes because it does behave uh, differently depending on the type of channel you have. So first of all, you can never delete the general channel. Uh, the general channel is the default channel. It's a standard channel that's created as part of every single team, and you just don't have an option to delete it. Uh, it's uh, the only channel that you can never delete on your team. However, let's say I want to delete this business requirements standard channel. You click three dots and then you click delete this channel. Very important, when you delete a standard channel, it will delete the channel from teams and it will delete all the conversations. However, it's not going to delete the files that are stored in SharePoint. It actually tells you that a conversation will be deleted, but the files will still reside in SharePoint. So let me proceed and delete this particular channel, uh, you will see it's gone from the uh, team now. However, back on the SharePoint site, uh, if you notice, here is my channel folder. It's still here. All the files are still here. Bottom line is when you delete a standard channel, all the files will remain, all the conversations will be deleted. Now, the behavior is a bit different with shared and private channels. If I try to delete this private channel now, three dots, delete this channel, it will actually warn me and tell me that all the files and conversations will be deleted. If you recall with private and shared channels, we actually have separate SharePoint sites created to store those files uh, that you store within private and shared uh, channels. 
So by deleting those channels from the team, you not only delete the conversations, you also delete those sites as well. So if I click the delete button, once again, we're going to see the channel being deleted from uh, the teams and behind the scenes, that site that got created when you created that private or shared channel was also deleted. There might be situations when you want to bring certain conversations uh, from Teams into Outlook. Um, here's a use case. Maybe you have a user who does not really use Teams and they heavily utilize uh, Outlook email client, uh, but there might be maybe an important conversation, an important message you want them to know about. So in this case, what you can do is actually share a particular specific conversation to that user in Outlook. To do that, all you need to do is just click the three dots next to the conversation you would like to share, click share to Outlook. And then all you have to do is just specify who you want to send an email to. In this case, I'm going to send this message to Mary. And this is exactly what Mary will get. She will actually get an email with an embedded message from Microsoft Teams. You just click send. And let me show you now what the experience will be for Mary. I'm logged in as Mary over here. And Mary just clicks on the message. And this is the message that she will see. Essentially, she will see the message from Teams Embedded. And if she is using Teams, if she is part of the team, she will be able to click on the link and access that particular message, that particular thread in a Teams channel. You can also do the opposite. You can actually bring in an Outlook email into Microsoft Teams. Uh, here's a use case. Let's say maybe you're communicating with an external vendor and they sent you something really important. And of course, they're not part of the Microsoft team, but yet you want the message to be part of Microsoft Teams uh, just for future reference. So what you can do is actually share that message with any team, with any channel that you wish. Here's how you do it. So once again, I'm logged in as Mary over here. This is the message I want to share with the rest of the team. So all you need to do is just click three dots and choose share to teams. At this point, you have to specify the name of the team or the name of the channel you want to share with. I'm going to use that project that we just created. Uh, so I'm going to post it into general channel within this particular team. You could, by the way, post it to any other team or any other channel, your choice. So I'm going to click this particular option. And all you have to do is just click share. You will get this confirmation message. Just click close. And this is how the message from Outlook will appear in Microsoft Teams. Essentially, it pretty much embeds the whole message with the header information from Outlook right into the body of the conversation in Microsoft Teams. So this way, with this particular option, if you have certain conversations that are still happening in Outlook outside of the team, if you really want to make Teams as your central hub, as your central repository for all the conversations, you can actually utilize this option and send those conversations from Outlook to Microsoft Teams. So this becomes the single go-to place for all the conversations and all the decisions for the project. There is also another cool integration that Outlook has with Microsoft Teams, and that is the ability to display channel-specific meetings, channel-specific events in a given channel. Uh, let me explain to you what I mean by that. So I actually went ahead and scheduled a few meetings. I scheduled one meeting inside of the general channel, which is a standard channel within a team, and I scheduled one meeting inside of the shared channel. Both events uh, happen to appear on my personal calendar. And this is the meeting that's happening within the shared channel. And I also have another meeting happening inside of the general standard channel. And of course, with all the personal meetings you might have and all these different teams meetings you might have happening inside of all those different teams and channels, it might be a bit overwhelming and crowded here to view all those events. Luckily, we have an option of adding a channel-specific calendar to a given channel. Let me show you how to do that. So I am inside of this team now, inside of the standard general channel. 
and I'm going to click the plus tab and the app you want to add is called channel calendar. If you don't have it on the list, just type in the name channel calendar and it will appear in the list and you can change and assign the name to it. Let's leave it alone, click add. And what's actually going to happen it's actually going to add a filtered view of that personal calendar that you have. It's only going to show you the events that are taking place for this particular channel. If you recall, my calendar had a few events. This event is happening in my shared channel. So that's why it only shows me this particular event, because this is the only event that I have inside of that particular team inside of this particular general channel. One thing worth noting here and something that I mentioned earlier in the tutorial, unfortunately, you will not be able to add the same app, that same channel calendar app to a shared or private channel. If I try to do that, you just will not be able to, you're not even going to see it on the list. And the reason for this are those limitations that we have on private and shared channels that I spoke about earlier in this tutorial. One of the most important collaborative aspects of Microsoft Teams is the fact that you can share the entire team to external party. Now, just to clarify first, I'm not talking about inviting external users to a given meeting. This is something you can easily do already by inviting both internal and external users when you schedule a meeting uh, from Microsoft Teams. I'm talking about sharing the entire team and all the channels externally to your clients, contractors, vendors, and so on. To share the team externally, all you have to do is just click three dots and choose add a member. Please note that this option is only available to the team owners. Regular team members cannot invite other members. Only team owners can do that. So since I'm the owner of this team, I'm going to choose add member. And of course, this is where you can specify users that are internal or external to your organization. Once you add the user, just click add. Uh, you will notice that they will get this guest designation. They're not going to be like any other member because they're going to have limited access. And all you have to do at this point is just click close. At this point, the invitation to join the team has been sent out to the external user. Let me now show you what the experience will be for the external user once they're invited to your team. So I'm logged in here as this external user under the Gmail account, the user gets an invitation similar to this one. And all they have to do is just click on open Microsoft Teams. If this is the first time they have been invited into your tenant, they will need to go through a few authentication steps and essentially create a user ID and password with Microsoft. However, since I already used this email previously, all I have to do here is just sign in. So I'm signing in under that Gmail account, click next. Then the user would need to enter the password they created when they created the user ID with Microsoft and click sign in. And this is what the experience will be for the external recipient. They will see the team name. They will see all the standard channels that exist. They will have access to all the standard channels under the team. Uh, since I already have one, that's the only channel they have access to. If you recall, I do have private and shared channels as well on my team, but the external users do not have permissions to join that. They have to be invited specifically into those. I do want to spend a minute on what kind of access the external users will get to the team and Microsoft 365 group. They will actually get access to most of the applications that are part of Microsoft 365 group. They will have limited access to Microsoft Teams. What that means is that they will not be able to create additional channels or tabs. This is something the regular members can do though. They will get add, edit, delete access to the SharePoint site that got created when the team was created, just like any other members. They will also have access to Planner, so they will be able to manage tasks just like regular members. They will also be able to receive emails that are part of the email distribution list. The only piece that they will not have access to is the calendar. The group calendar will only be accessible by team members. External users will not have access to the calendar portion 
of the Microsoft 365 Group. When it comes to notifications in Teams, there are actually three different places where you can configure those. You can configure notifications at the global level, you can configure notifications at the channel level, and finally, you can configure notifications at the conversation level. Let me first show you how to configure notifications globally. For that, all you have to do is just click the three dots next to your name in the upper right corner, click settings, then click the notifications tab on the left. And there are different scenarios how you can configure your notifications. For example, at the moment, I decided to only be notified when somebody replies to me or mentions my name. You can change it to all activities. Essentially, with this option, you will be notified when any activity is happening within Microsoft Teams. Or finally, you can actually customize it by clicking the custom button. And this is where you can actually customize notifications for different activities, different scenarios happening in Microsoft Teams. For example, when somebody mentions my name within a given team or a channel, I can actually specify whether I want to be notified through the feed only or through the banner as well. The banner they're talking about here is that banner in the lower right hand corner that you typically see when somebody mentions your name or replies to your message. And the same applies to the other scenarios. Once again, if uh, somebody replied to a conversation I started, I can either turn off the notification completely, show it in the feed, or once again, display it both in banner and the feed. There are some additional notification settings you can adjust. For example, when I do the personal chat, uh, once again, I can uh, specify the different scenarios and notifications for different activities happening during the personal chat. Very important to note is that notifications you adjust here on the screen apply to all the teams and all the channels. These are your personal notification settings, but they're global to the whole team's application. You can also adjust notifications at the channel level as well. So say, for example, you have a channel that is kind of super important and you want to be notified about uh, happenings and activities happening inside of this channel. What you can do is click the three dots, channel notifications, and then either set it to all activity or off, or you can choose custom. And this is where you can adjust the notification settings for this particular channel. By default, it's off. But for example, uh, if the activity in this channel is super important to me, I can actually convert it to banner and feed. This way I will be notified through notifications happening in the feed, as well as banners, the small pop-ups that you get to see in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. After you make the changes, make sure to click save, and this will assure that you will be notified next time something is happening inside of this channel. Finally, you can also configure notification settings for a given conversation happening inside of Teams. Say, for example, you configured your global notification settings and maybe even configured your channel notification settings, but there is one conversation where lots and lots of team members uh, click the reply button and reply to that particular message, and you're just getting frustrated with all those additional banners and pop-ups that you get inside of Microsoft Teams. What you can do in this case is actually mute that particular conversation so you're not going to be bothered with any further notifications. To do that, just click the three dots next to the thread, next to the message, and click turn off notifications. And what will happen, it will just mute this particular conversation. You're still going to be notified about conversations and mentions and replies in other threads, but for this particular one, you are not going to be bothered anymore. Microsoft Teams has a really convenient and powerful search feature. At the top of the Teams application, you will see the search bar. And essentially, if you are trying to find something, just type in whatever it is that you're searching for. In my case, I'm typing the keyword lunch. And what will happen, you will get a lot of results and it will pretty much match the particular keyword against any messages or files, and it will display those results on the screen. If you notice, it matched this particular keyword against a bunch of messages that are displayed on the screen. 
It also found this particular keyword inside of one of my files, uh, inside of one of my PDF documents that I happen to store in one of the teams. So the search is really powerful and it will definitely find what you're looking for. Since the search in Teams is pretty powerful and it will pick up on keywords uh, inside of the messages and various files that you store in Teams, sometimes you might want to find a very specific message or a file with that particular keyword. So in my case, when I typed in the word lunch, I was actually looking for a message that I sent to my team members in one of my teams inside of one of my channels. So in this case, if you want to pinpoint the exact instance, the exact message, all you need to do after you get the generic search result is just click on the messages tab. And now it filters out all the other types of content only focusing on the messages. However, I'm also looking for this particular message for this particular keyword inside of a specific team. So I'm going to type in the name of my team. You can actually specify the name of the channel that you're searching in. In my case, I'm looking inside of this project team. And guess what? It now found that particular message that I sent yesterday within the team, within the general standard channel, and we asked my team, where should we go for lunch? Just like you can search for messages inside of Microsoft Teams, you can also search for files as well. So I typed in the word budget into the search window. And of course, it found me a bunch of messages uh, that contain this particular keyword. It found me a, a number of files that contain this particular keyword. But in this case, I'm looking for a specific file that I posted to one of my team's channels. So in this case, you want to click on the Files tab. This will filter out all the other results. It will only show you the results for the files and not messages. And just like with messages, you can actually specify a specific team that you're searching for. So in this case, I'm searching this project team. And look at this. It now presents me with the results just for this particular team. And it found me this file inside of this team inside of one of its channels. Most of the features I showed you so far in this tutorial were applicable to all the team members. However, what I would like to do now is show you some of the features, some of the settings available exclusively to the team owners. In case if you are the team owner, you might want to adjust some default out-of-the-box settings and maybe tweak some permissions for your team members and guests. Or maybe you need to restore a deleted channel. All those activities can only be managed by team owners. And that's exactly what I would like to show you now. To manage those settings, all you have to do is just click three dots next to the team name and click Manage Team. There are several tabs that exist here. You can manage your membership under the Members tab. Under the Channels tab, you can create new channels and restore the deleted ones. Under the Settings tab, you can manage some of the security settings and permissions for your team members and guests. And finally, under the tags feature, you can manage the tags that you create for your team. One of the things you can change on your team if you're a team owner is change its privacy level. If you recall, when we created this team and we created this team from scratch, the first question we had to answer was the privacy level. And this particular team was created as private. However, you can change this to any other privacy level as you wish. To do that, click the three dots next to an existing team, click Edit Team, and you can change the name of your team as well as the privacy level. And for example, let's say I want to change it from private to public. A public means that anyone can join the team without my permission. I can then change it back as necessary. You can do it as many times as you wish. If you created your team with a privacy level private, that means that your users cannot join your team as they wish. As a team owner, you have to invite them in. To add additional members to the team, what you have to do is click the three dots, manage team, 
And under the members tab, you will be able to see the owners and members of the existing team. This is the same screen where we added our external guests. To add additional team members, just click the add button and type in the name of the users you would like to add. This could be users inside and outside of your organization. Once you click add, by default, your users, your team members will be added as members. The difference between members and owners is that members cannot add other members. Only owners can do that. And owners are the only people who can manage all this advanced settings that we're changing now. Once you click close, the invitation will be sent out to the recipient and the user will be able to join your team and access the team, the standard channels, as well as all the other assets that are created as part of Microsoft 365 Group. Just to remind you, the private and shared channels have its own membership. By inviting a user to the team, you are just inviting them to all the standard channels. If you want to invite the users to private and shared channels, you have to do so separately by clicking the three dots and managing membership for that particular channel. When you add members to your team, they actually end up having lots of power. Uh, members can add and delete channels. Members can add and delete uh, tabs and applications. Members have lots and lots of power inside of your team. However, if you are the team owner, you might want to adjust that. To do so, click three dots next to the team name, click Manage Team, and then click the Settings tab. There are several things you can adjust here, and one of the sections is called Member Permissions. If you click on it, you will be able to specify at a very granular level the permissions for your members. If you notice, by default, all the checkboxes are checked. So what that means is that uh, your regular members can create channels, delete channels, uh, add and remove applications, and so on. For example, let's say I'm the owner of the team, and I really do not want my team members to create any new channels. If this is the case, all I need to do is just uncheck the box. Or maybe I do want them to create standard channels, but I do not want them to create any private channels. And on top of that, I also do not want them to delete any channels. Likewise, maybe you do not want them to add or remove applications that you see on top of each and every channel. Once again, if this is the case, just tweak the settings accordingly. Just a reminder, you're not going to see a shared channel here. And the reason for that is because shared channels can only be created and deleted by team owners. Regular members cannot create or delete shared channels. Just like you can manage your member permissions, you can also manage your guest permissions, essentially permissions for the external users that you invite to your team. Now, by default, external users do not have the ability to create channels. However, if for whatever reason you do want your external users, your guests, to be able to create channels within your team, what you have to do is click the corresponding chat box. One other setting you can adjust as the team owner is that for tags. If you recall early in this tutorial, I showed you how to create a tag. That is the ability to tag multiple team members at once by creating a tag, a specific tag for your users. By default, the tags can only be created by team owners. However, if you are the team owner, you might want to delegate this ability to team members as well. To do so, click on the settings tab under tags. By default, it says tags are managed by team owners. You can actually say team owners and members. And what this will allow your team members to do now, when they click three dots, manage team, they will be able to click on the tags feature and they will be able to delete tags or create new ones, just like team owners can. One other feature available to team owners is the ability to restore deleted channels. If you navigate to three dots next to the team name and click Manage Team, under the Channels tab, you will see a list of channels that exist for the given team. 
under the deleted dropdown, you will actually get to see the channels have been deleted. If you recall earlier in this tutorial, we actually deleted a few channels. We deleted a standard channel, and we also deleted a private channel. Both of those channels appear under the deleted dropdown in the team setting. You can easily restore the deleted channels by clicking the restore button. If I click the restore button next to the standard channel, it will go ahead and restore the standard channel and put it back under the given team in Microsoft Teams. If you recall, when I deleted the standard channel, it actually deleted the channel itself, but it left the folder in SharePoint with all the files inside of it. So once I click restore, it will actually add the channel back into Microsoft Teams, and you will notice that all the conversations are back to where they used to be. And if we click on the Files tab on the channel we just restored, we are going to see all the files still appearing in Microsoft Teams, so to be precise, appearing from that SharePoint document library. We can also restore any private or shared channels as well. So if you recall, we deleted this management private channel. Once again, we click the Restore button. In this case, when we deleted this private channel, not only the channel was deleted, but also was the SharePoint site that was created as part of this private channel. Now that the channel has been restored, it goes back into the list of channels under a given team. If I click on the channel now, you're going to see all the conversations. I guess we didn't have any, but if I click on the Files tab, once again, all the files will still be in place. And obviously the SharePoint site that was deleted when this channel was deleted was also restored. One important thing to note is that by default, both team members and team owners can create, delete, and restore deleted channels. However, there is a setting in the settings tab that team owners can adjust where team owners can prevent team members from deleting and restoring channels. Here is that option. So by default, the box is checked. So that means everyone, whether you are a team member or team owner, you can delete and restore channels. However, if team owner unchecks this box, this will not allow any team member to delete or restore channels anymore. This functionality will only be available to team owners. One other thing you can do as a team owner is moderate conversations within the team's channels. Now, you can only moderate conversations in standard channels. You cannot moderate conversations in private or shared channels. And this would be especially useful if you have a really large team and you probably want to limit the number of messages sent uh, by restricting it to people who can send messages or reply to messages. The way you moderate conversations is a bit different on a general channel compared to the other standard channels. To moderate conversations in a general channel, which is of course a default kind of catch-all channel, click three dots next to general and then click manage channel. And by default, anyone can post messages. However, let's say you have a really large team and you probably only want team owners to post messages. In this case, you can click on this option. Only owners can post messages. Or maybe in some cases, you do want to allow everyone to post messages, but at the same time, you do want to warn them about the audience size and the number of people who will receive that message. In this case, you might want to click this middle checkbox. Anyone can post, but it will kind of warn everyone and notify everyone about the number of people who will see that message. Let me show you how this works. So we configure this option. We now go ahead and post a new conversation. And when I try to type in a message, it actually tells me right here, five people will see your message. So if you have a really large team, maybe 50 people, a few hundred people, it's probably a great option to include. Moderation works a bit differently on the other standard channels. So I just showed you how to moderate conversations on the general channel. However, let me now do the same under the business requirements, which is another standard channel that I have. Three dots, manage channel. By default, you will notice that moderation is off. However, there are a few things you can do here. First of all, you can actually choose this last radio button which says everyone except guests can start a new post. So with this option, you pretty much restrict conversations, the ability to have conversations to just internal team members. With this option, you pretty much restrict 
the ability to start new conversations just to the internal users. With this option, your external users, your guests, will not be able to start new conversations. However, they will still be able to reply to the existing conversations. Another thing you can do is actually enable moderation. And by default, team owners are the moderators. And essentially, by default, only the moderators, only the team owners will be able to start a new post. So that means you are pretty much excluding your team members from the ability to start a new post. The few checkboxes at the bottom of the screen allow you to customize moderation a bit further. So by default, for example, members will be able to still reply to channel messages. If you want to prevent that, all you need to do is just uncheck that box. If you created your team for a temporary project and let's say the project has ended, you might want to archive the team. When you archive a team, it actually does not delete anything. It doesn't delete any conversations. It does not delete any files. Instead, it makes the whole thing read only. So to archive a team, what you need to do is click on this little gear icon in the lower left-hand corner. Once you click that little gear icon, you will see a list of all the teams that you own. The ability to archive a team is only available to team owners. Regular team members cannot archive a team. So to archive a team, all you have to do is just click the three dots next to the team name and choose archive team option. And it actually tells you what's going to happen once you archive a team. By default, it freezes all the conversations. Once again, it does not delete anything. It just literally makes the whole team read only. So it freezes all the conversations. So nobody can start new conversations. Nobody can reply to existing conversations. In addition, you can check that box and that will make the SharePoint site that got created when the team was created read only as well. Because by default, team members obviously have add, added, delete privileges on that SharePoint site. By clicking the checkbox, the site itself will become read only as well. So what that means is that you will not be able to add, edit, delete documents on that site. And in my opinion, this is a really cool feature because once you truly archive a team, a project, you really don't want anyone to go there and start making changes. Once you decide what you want to do, all you need to do is just click that archive button and the team will be archived. You will notice in a few seconds that the team will disappear from the list of your teams. Once again, it was not deleted, it was archived. If you do need to access the team again and maybe to unarchive it, what you need to do is under the archived drop down, choose the name of the team you want to unarchive and essentially restore. Click three dots and you click restore team. And what will happen now, the team will appear back in the list of active teams. And now you can chat again and uh, access all the files and make changes. You pretty much restore the team to its original location. There might be situations when instead of archiving a team, you might want to delete it. When you delete a team, it actually deletes all the channels, all the conversations, all the SharePoint sites associated with the team. Once again, the ability to delete a team is only available to team owners. Regular team members cannot delete a team. To delete a team, all you have to do is just click the three dots and then choose delete the team option. It will give you a warning message. It will essentially tell you that everything will be deleted. So you kind of have to agree to this. And once you click the deleted team button, the team will be deleted. Once again, all the conversations, all the channels, all the SharePoint sites have been deleted. In case if you deleted a team and need to restore it, at this point, you will need to contact your IT administrator only IT admins can restore a team at that point. Once the team is deleted, it actually goes to the admin recycle bin. It stays there for 30 days. And after that, it is permanently deleted. So in case if you change your mind and you do want to restore a team that you deleted, you do have 30 days to do so. But again, at this point, you will need to contact your IT administrator and they should be able to restore the team within 30 days.